This is part three of the Hyperledger Composer development series. In the last two videos that we um, went through, we talked about the development environment, how to set that up, and also the modeling language for the Composer environment. In this video, we're going to be focusing in on the permissions.acl file, which you can see here is blank at the moment, but this is basically what defines you know, who can see what in the network and, and who can do what in the network. So there are two types of control within each business network. There's business network access, which is essentially the front end of things. Um, for example, you know, maybe you give the CEO just like a read-only access to the network because um, that's all they might want to do. Or maybe you give a farmer or a shipper the ability to create new contracts within the network to exchange perishable goods but you don't want them to be able to delete other players or participants in the network. This is all controlled with the business network access. There's also network administrative access which you can think of more in terms of the actual developers behind the business network. Um, this access kind of defines who is allowed to create different identities within the network and a lot of things related to the code itself. And you might be wondering, what are these identities? And we'll be going through this throughout the video and you'll understand this a lot better. For now, we're going to put it on the back burner and jump over to a more visual representation of our network. Before we get started though, I want to point out just a few things. First in the model file. Since we created our own model file in the last video, just wanted to note that we made one change between now and then. So the namespace is now org.acme.shipping.perishable, which is actually the default namespace that was created um, or that came with the sample perishable network. And the reason that I put it back to this default namespace is because I've also included the default script file which depends on that namespace. And the reason that I put this script file in here is because a lot of the rules, a lot of the permissions that we're going to be demonstrating has a lot to do with the um, functionality of the network and then we're not going to be able to demonstrate it well without this script file. So although we haven't covered it yet and we will cover it in um, later videos, just know that it's here. So just to do a quick review, let's go back to the code editor and pull up the terminal. So we're in our perishable network directory. And I just want to remind you how I got what I have up in the playground right now. I just used the composer archive create command um, to create a new .bna file. You can see the command succeeded and then I come over and import, replace, drop here to upload or browse, click the perishable network.bna, open that, and import it. Replace the current network, and we have uploaded our network successfully. Now what you might see here is we don't have a permissions file in this network. There's no permissions file on this left-hand side. So we can go ahead and create this file. But before we do so, actually, let me just mention that if you don't create a permissions file within your network, then everyone has all access to do whatever they want within the network. So if that's why this works without it, but we obviously want to permission our network a little bit. So we'll go ahead and add the file. Come down here, access control file, and add. And you can see it's put a little template in there already. And we'll go ahead and use this template to just get the basic syntax of what a rule is defined by. The syntax behind the ACL file is actually not that complex. There are only a few things that you need to really understand in order to create your own business rules. The first thing is the actual syntax of the rule. And the second thing is the whole namespace behind this network. And I'm going to go ahead and touch on both of those right now. So the basic syntax of the rule is you first start out by defining rule. It's pretty self-explanatory. Then you give the rule a name, give it a little bracket, and come down here and say, uh, give it a description, which is totally arbitrary. You can say whatever you'd like. 
So we'll say this is a description. And that's just good to kind of tell developers, you know, what the rule you created actually does in, in a really quick way. Then we come down and say participant, which I'm going to skip over for just a second. We'll say operation, which you can, there are actually five different possibilities for this. We can say all, just like above, or we can um, say one of the four different operations that are, you know, that make up that all. So that would be create, read, um, update, and delete. So crud, just like if you are any, if you've done any sort of development, you're really familiar with this. So we can define one, um, we can define two of them, or we can just go ahead and say all. And we give it a resource, which we will also be coming back to. And then finally, an action, which is just one of two options. You can say allow, or you can say deny. So I said we'd come back to the participant and resource fields, because this requires a little bit better understanding of the system and just the model namespace that we've defined. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this over to the code editor just because it's going to get deleted once we start moving around this playground. And let's take a look at the test uh, tab. We can see, just as a reminder, the participants in our network are grower, importer, shipper, and then our assets are contract and shipment. And then we have a transactions field. And you can remember in previous videos we talked that these are the three class uh, classes within our business network. So just keep that in mind. And now we're going to hop over to our text file. Let's just ignore this whole identities thing for just a little bit longer. We'll come down here and talk about namespaces. So if you recall, the namespace that we defined in our model file is org dot acme dot shipping dot perishable and remember this is the the default one that I went back to and explained earlier in the video anyways this is the uh, the defined namespace now if we wanted to target a specific participant in the network you know say uh, if we wanted to create a rule that says no um, importer is allowed to delete any of the assets, you know, a contract or, or whatever. No importer is allowed to do that. So we'd have to find a way to target that importer within our rule. So the way we do that is just by appending one thing onto the end of our defined namespace. We'll say perishable dot importer. And right there, we've said to the access file, okay, we're talking about all importers within the business network. If we wanted to go a little bit further and define a specific importer that we wanted to limit or grant access certain things to, we'd just put a hashtag and then say whatever that importer at email.com or whatever that identified by field was within our model file. So if we go, I'm just going to pull that model file up real quick, and you can see we here's our namespace that we defined, and if we come down to the bottom, we have our participant, grower, shipper, and importer. Extends business. We come up to business, and we see that it's identified by email. So by saying org.acme.shipping.perishable.importer hashtag whatever the email address is, we are targeting that specific participant in the network. Likewise, we could do that with pretty much any participant in the network or any asset. So we could say our contract, or we could say even our, you know, whatever contract ID. So you kind of see how that works, how we're targeting different participants within the network. Now we have to kind of roll it back a little bit and introduce a new concept into this uh, picture. What we haven't covered yet in terms of namespaces 
is there is actually a system namespace that underlies the namespace that we've created within our model file. So there's actually other ways to target these participants in the network. We're going to jump over to the GitHub of Hyperledger Composer and look at one file which defines the system namespace. You can see that it's org.hyperledger.composer.system.cto. And within this, you can come down and just scroll through and see that the abstract system asset um, that all assets extend. And this is asset. Abstract system participant that all participants extend. And that's participant. So you can kind of start to see that all of these um, participants and assets and transactions that we're putting in our own networks within our uh, user-defined namespaces are coming from this system namespace. Now this becomes of use to us in several ways. While we're at this file, I'm going to just walk down to this line right here, copy it, and come back to our code editor. We're going to paste this under identities because it's going to be very useful when we come back and talk about identities. For now, just remember that I put that there, and we'll get into the system namespace. So org.hyperledger.composer.system. This right here is the system namespace, and it contains pretty much everything that we made within our own namespace. So an alternative way to target everyone in our network is to come over to our system namespace and say dot participant. So this is going to target all of the different players within our network. This would be the grower, importer, and shipper. Likewise, we could say system dot asset. That's going to target both of these assets, the contract and the shipment. And we can do things like transaction, we can do event, and a few more. So there's actually multiple ways to target different participants in the network. We could also come up here to our user defined namespace and say dot star. So that's actually equivalent to saying dot participant on our system namespace because we're saying that we want everything within our user defined namespace. Now this is how we you know, target every one and everything in our network. If we came over here though, we can also do something interesting and say star star. This is a recursive way, it's a recursive targeting method which is basically saying that we want to target everything within the system namespace, which actually includes everything that we have defined up here in our namespace, as well as several other resources that we saw within this file here. But it's interesting because it'll take all of those things and then also target everything beneath those things. So it's a recursive targeting method. So these are just useful um, ways to target different uh, resources within the network and we'll have to keep this in mind as we write our different rules. After all that we can now come over and see what I was talking about in this permissions file. So I won't write everything out again but I had mentioned that we're going to come back to the participant and the resource fields and you can see we're talking about namespaces here particularly in this uh, rule, the system namespace. So we're saying that this rule is going to apply to the participant defined as org.hyperledger.composer.system.participant. So that's basically saying that this all access rule applies to every participant within our network. So that's going to include the grower, the importer, and the shipper. So this specific rule is applying to the grower, importer, and shipper and what it's saying is that those um, players or those participants in this network can perform any operation so we can they can create, they can read, they can 
update, or delete anything, or uh, those are the operations that those participants can do, and what can they do them on is defined in the resource field, which is saying org.hyperledger.composer.system.star star. So that's basically just saying that these participants are allowed to perform all operations on pretty much anything within our network. And then finally we come down to the action and it's saying allow. So what if I did this and said deny? So I update and it's saying that the admin does not have create access to this resource. So we say allow and we've updated successfully. Okay, so that's just an overview on the syntax of the rule. Now we can go ahead and delete this and start writing the appropriate permissions.acl file for this perishable network. So we're going to start off by saying the default rule. Get the description, and we're going to allow all participants access to all resources. So similar to the rule that we just deleted. Our participant is any. This is also another way of targeting everyone within the network. So we can we can say any or we can say um, org.hyperledger.composer.system.participant We're going to give this partic these, partic these participants the opportunity to perform all operations on the resource defined by org.acme.shipping.perishable.star. So that's everything within our network. So we're just saying that all the participants are allowed to do whatever they want with any of the transactions, the assets, or even the other participants. So in this network, it's basically saying that, you know, a importer can delete a grower from the network, which we probably would not want. So we'll come back to that. Then we have a system ACL rule, which is an all access grant everything to everybody. So in this first rule, we're just granting everyone access to all the things within our user-defined network, but we did not say down here that they're allowed to do, um, oh, and I also forgot to say action allow. Anyways, we did not say that this participant or all the participants in our network can do everything within the system namespace. This is just our user defined namespace. So this system rule is going to give them access to that. So we'll say org.hyperledger.composer.system.participant. Give them all operations. And they can do those operations on everything in the entire network. And the reason that this was defined as the default in this sample network is just so that you can, you know, users are not confused when all of a sudden they're denied access to do something. But anyways, we probably would not want that, and we'll come back to it. Now these last two, um, we'll go ahead and put a comment here and say these are special cases, but very important at the same time. So these last ones have to do with the network admin user, which if we, before we get too far, let's go ahead and update this and then come back over and look and see this piece of text that I had copied over from the system ACL file. And that's just to demonstrate that there's actually this class called network admin which comes packed by default. Uh, there's one admin in each business network when you first create it. 
So you can see up in the corner, I have this admin. And then if we go to the ID registry, which we're going to come back to, you can see that all we have, the only IDs we have are the admin, and, they're, and this admin is in use. Now by default, the rules governing this admin are not defined. So we have to say that we want to allow this admin to do whatever they need to do to manage the network. So we're going to give them full access to user resources in this rule. And once again, as we had copied over from that GitHub file, the system file, we're going to target that class of network admin as the participant that this rule targets. We're going to give them privilege to do all operations, and we're going to say they can do those operations on absolutely every resource within our network. And then finally, we're going to say network admin system. So this rule right here gives them all access to everything within our user defined namespace, but not the system. So we have to do that down here because we certainly wouldn't want a network admin unable to alter the code within our system or add different participants to the network. And I'll go ahead and capitalize these because that's the differences between those two rules. And this participant is the same exact participant that we just targeted. The system.admin or network admin class. Once again, we're giving them all operation operations and we're giving those operations on the resource defined by everything within the system because this is a recursive call. And finally, we're going to allow. So right there, we're going to update. And we have adequately defined everything that we need to for this uh, sample network, this sample perishable network. So now that you understand the syntax a little bit better behind these rules, Let's dig in a little bit and see if we can't make this business network more interesting than it is right now. And as I said, um, the reason that this default network permissions file is so boring is just because it allows all access to everyone and there's no troubles when someone trying to get more familiar with Hyperledger Composer um, deploys the perable, perishable network and wants to interact with it. But in real life, this is not the case. So in order to understand uh, this a little bit better, we need to create a few more participants. So we're going to go to the test tab, and we'll create participants in the grower category. So we're going to create a new participant, and this participant is identified by their email. So I'm going to just say something that we're all going to remember. So something like um, Billy at gmail.com and we'll give them a balance of 10,000. So we created Billy and now what we want to do is create a rule that says Billy is not allowed to delete any of these assets. So normally as um, normally any participant in the network is allowed to come over to this contract, create a new one, and then they can come over and click this little delete button and it's successfully deleted. Although, let me remind you, it's all stored in this transactions history. But anyways, I digress. Let's go over to the ID registry and this is where we're going to start to get into the um, identities part of the video. And what we're going to do is we're going to issue 
a new ID for Billy. So we're going to say issue new ID. The ID name, we'll just call him Billy. And then the participant, we'll say org.acme.shipping.perishable.grower hashtag Billy at gmail.com. And it successfully recognizes this. We're not going to check this box that says allow this, ish this ID to issue new IDs. We'll touch on this a little bit later. But for now, we're not allowing that. So we'll recreate this new identity. And now what we're going to do, this is something that's very new. We haven't done this before, is come over to Billy in the, uh, the wallet and say use now. So right now, you can see up in the top right corner, we're using Billy, the participant, rather than the admin participant that we have been using in the past. So we'll come over to our permissions.acl file, and we'll create that rule that says Billy cannot delete any of the assets. Okay, so Billy cannot delete any asset. We're going to identify Billy as a participant, just like we did when we created issue to his ID. Shipping.perishable.grower, Billy at gmail.com. Operation delete. We're going to say he cannot delete any asset. So to say that, we're going to come to the system namespace and say asset. And then this is very important. For our action, instead of allow, we're going to say deny. Okay, so everything looks good. We update the permissions file. And let's go ahead and test it out. So we'll go over to test. You can see that we have um, just one asset right now. So we didn't say anything about Billy not being able to create a new asset, so we'll go ahead and create one. And then what we're going to see is that Billy should not be able to delete one of these assets. So we'll just go to the one we just created and press delete. But what happened? Billy was able to delete that asset. And this is something that is very important to understand about this permissions.acl file is that when we think of an action, when Billy comes over here as the current user, comes to one of the assets and tries to delete it, then Hyperledger Composer Framework is going to run from the top to the bottom of this permissions file and see what rules apply. So this is super, super important. Top to bottom, read order. This is very, very important because what's happening here is when Billy tries to delete that particular asset, what the system is doing, or what the, the framework is doing is reading down until it finds an instance of Billy within one of the rules. So if we see this, we say the first rule is the default rule, and this rule uh, targets any participant in our network. So does that include Billy? Well, of course it does. And what does this uh, default rule tell us? Well, Billy can do anything on anything within our network. So it stops right there, and then it doesn't read any of this after, after it finds this first rule. So Putting this at the bottom of the file is not going to do anything. So we're going to cut that and put it at the very top of the file. And we'll update our permissions file. Now we can come over to the test tab. And remember, we are still operating under Billy. We're going to go to Contract, press Delete, OK. And it's going to say an error has occurred. Billy at gmail.com does not have delete access to the resource. Okay, so that has demonstrated just kind of how the permissions file works. And it's very important to understand 
how this permissions file is read in order for you to define the rules correctly. To get a little bit more creative with things, we can also include conditional rules to our ACL file. Now at this moment, Billy cannot delete any contract within this business network. But what if we created a conditional rule that said Billy can only delete contracts that he is himself a part of. So the way we would do that is say, let's add this to the top of our file. We'll say can delete. We'll say Billy can delete contracts that he is a part of. We'll identify Billy as a participant again. Actually, a quicker way to do this is just copy and paste. His operation is delete. It's resource that we are targeting is a contract. And the action is allow. So as this rule stands right now, we're basically just allowing Billy to delete any contract he wants. But if we want to do a conditional on this, let's create a variable for Billy as a participant. We'll call it M. And you just put this at the end of this line before the colon in parentheses. And then for the resource, we'll call it V. And then after the resource field, we'll add another field called condition. And we'll say the condition is v.grower.getIdentifier. And this is just part of the API of Hyperledger Composer. You'll have to, we'll get more into this with the JavaScript part of things, but just as an example. So we're saying that we are going to allow Billy to delete a contract under the condition that the grower on that contract, so um, we've actually defined, right, so the grower on the contract, so our resource identifies the contract, that is V, so we say V.grower, so the grower of the contract, and the identifier on that, equals the identifier on the participant m, uh, which would be billy at gmail.com. So let's go ahead and update. We can come over to test. And you can see um, in the contract, if we drop one of these down, we can see that there's a grower field, a shipper field, and an importer field. So we just basically said if the grower dot get identifier which is the, the identifier is this one right here. If that equals Billy at gmail.com, then Billy up here as the currently uh, registered ID wants to delete it, he has to be on the contract. So we'll see if that works. So this one, Billy is not a part of. So we'll try to delete it. And it says we cannot delete it. We don't have access to. Now let's come down and find one that he is on. So contract four. We can see Billy is a part of this contract. So we'll press delete and it successfully deletes Billy, Billy's contract. So you can start to see the flexibility that you have with this permissions file. And you can also see the possibilities um, for creating a pretty complex business network with Hyperledger Composer. Now at this point, if this is all that you wanted to hear, um, just in this visual Hyperledger Composer playground environment, then uh, you can probably cut the video off here. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. But at this point, I'm going to get back to the command line and kind of show you some identity management. Because so far, we've just created identities in the Composer environment, and it's pretty pretty simple drag and drop procedure 
Um, if I want to use the admin, I use that. If I want to use Billy, I use that. If I want to uh, remove Billy, I can just remove him. It's really, really simple. And that's what the Composer uh, Playground is for. But in real life, we're going to have to manage these identities along with the permissions.acl file uh, on the command line and within our code. So that's what I'm going to show you now. And uh, it might get pretty technical, so user beware. So what I've done is I've copied the permissions.acl file that we created in the playground and just copied it into our local environment. So I had mentioned we were going to come back to the whole concept of identities. And one of the major things that I want to touch on is this whole network admin uh, class. And the reason is because if you're a developer trying to create a big business network, and you, you're really not going to be able to do that alone. You're going to have developers at different points of control in the network. You know, a, you know, in, within an industry, there's going to be several different businesses, and within each business, you're going to have a network admin that should be able to grant access, uh, issue identities, and grant access to other admins to control the network. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. And the way that we create a new participant call, uh, of the network admin class is via the command line or via the JavaScript API. You can see if we came back to the Composer Playground, there's really no way to create that participant uh, because it's only showing the grower, importer, and shipper. You could come over to the ID registry um, and issue a new ID, but if we typed in org.hyperledger.composer.system.network.admin and just gave it a name, you can see that this does not exist in the participant registry. But as we saw in the uh, GitHub file, we actually have this participant right down here. So we that's the limitation of the playground as far as I am aware. I don't know of any way you can create this participant, but you can do so via the command line. And then the way we're going to do that is by first coming, we have to get into our um, fabric tools and we have to start up the network. We have to well, just for good measure, well, no, we already downloaded the network. If you haven't done this before, you have to download the fabric, but we're going to just start it because I've already downloaded it. This kind of creates all the Docker images and puts up the Hyperledger fabric. And once we have started the fabric, if you have to download it, it'll actually take quite some time. Um, but you'll download, start it, and then if it's your first time doing this, we have to create the composer profile. And you can actually see that. We'll cat this out. It's in your home directory. Um, composer connection profiles. Under HLF, Hyperledger Fabric, V1. And connections.json. And you can see that this same one was printed out. So that's the path to this connection. And you'll see how we use this connection in a second. So to deploy this business network that we have, which I will remind you is defined here. We've done this in the previous videos. We have our permissions.acl file. Um, I've used the default logic.js file, um, package.json, blah, blah, blah. So. In order to deploy this network to the Hyperledger fabric, we have to take just a few steps. First, we're going to get back into our perishable network directory because we currently have the fabric running on our system in Docker containers. And once we're in our perishable network, we're going to cd into our dist directory, which I'll remind you has our .bna. 
Um, this is the one that we imported to the playground. And then we'll say composer network deploy. Or let me get this at the top of the screen. Clear first. Composer network deploy dash a is going to be perishable network dot bna because that's the bni bna file that we want to deploy this is kind of like importing on the playground our connection profile is the one that we just saw and created these are just formalities for doing the first uh, deploying it for the first time um, our identity is peer admin and our password for that identi identity we're just going to put random string and then last we're going to say dash a admin dash s so this is going to create that admin user that we saw over here this admin user that we get when we first log in to the playground Okay, so our command has succeeded, we've deployed the network, and now we can start our identity management. So we remember this participant that we couldn't add in the playground, but now we're going to add one. Because, you know, I want to be the administrator for the network, and I want to be able to issue new identities. So I'm going to create a participant in the network that is under the class network admin with the user ID of Zach. So the way that I do that is I will come to terminal or the command line and I will say composer participant add. And before we get too far into this, I'll just say with any of these commands you can do dash dash help and it'll show you exactly how the command works. You can see the different options. But I'll walk you through that. So composer participant add dash p that's saying what network do we want to deploy it to or what connection profile do we want. So that's Hyperledger Fabric v1. We want to deploy the perishable network We've already deployed it, so it knows what this is. We want to create an ID, a user ID of Zach. We want to give that, um, or actually, no, this is this is completely wrong. We have to, we cannot do that yet. This is the inclination, but we actually have to create this new administrator with the current admin. So by default, this admin that is in the playground up here has a username of admin and a password of admin pw for password. Okay, and then we'll say flag d, and then this is where we get to create our new participant. So we'll say a class of org.hyperledger, and this is where the um, system namespace kind of comes into play because we're going to take our network admin create a new participant and then as we saw as we saw on the github this participant the network admin is identified by participant ID so we have to enter that And I'll call myself Zach. And then that's all we have to enter. Close the string off. And this should, if I got it right, should create myself as a new administrator. Okay, so this participant was successfully added to the registry. Now, what we can do is check to see um, who is in the registry right now by saying composer identity list the connection profile that we want the network that we're talking about and for now we'll just use the 
old admin because we haven't set my profile up correct or fully yet. And you can see that we have shown all their certificates within this network. And what you'll notice is the one that we just added, Zach, is not in this registry yet. So we can see the admin, which has this right here is the actual certificate. This is authorized by the Hyperledger Fabric Certificate Authority. And you can see that it's activated. But what about the one that we just created? What about myself? So let's clear the terminal and what we have to do in order to put me in the I like in the registry is issue an identity. So remember when we were over in the playground and we said issue new ID, we issued the new ID and then we bound it to a specific participant. And that's exactly what we have to do here. So we're going to say composer identity issue. Give it our connection profile, our network, Once again, we have to use the old admin still, but then we're going to say dash u, give it my user ID, dash a, and then we'll say resource because I'm technically a resource in the, I'm technically a resource in this network. And then we'll target myself. And then lastly, and this is pretty important if you're actually running a network, if you do this flag at the end, dash dash issuer, then that's going to create my identity and say that I'm allowed to issue new identities. And now, this is really important to keep in mind, it's going to pr print off my user ID and my user secret, or in other words, password. So I'm going to want to copy this and store it somewhere safe so that I don't forget it. Because I'm going to use that to actually log in and uh, do specific things with this network. So next, we can ping the network to make sure that my identity is there. So composer network ping, give it once again the connection profile, the network we're talking about. Now I can use myself. So the username is Zach. The password is what we just saw up here. And then that should work if I've been added to the network correctly and bound to this specific uh, identity. So you can see that this participant is within the network. And then lastly, we can just do that identity list command again. And this time, I should be in the registry. And we're going to go ahead and just do this with the admin, just because it's simpler to type. And we can see that now there's two certificates within our network. We have the admin and we have Zach, myself. So you can see how easy this is with identity management once we understand it because we can just switch the people in the network that we're using with a few flags. So I could say Zach with the password and we could list the identities or we could just switch to the admin user and list the identities. Either one works. And this is the exact same thing as coming over to the um, the ID registry and you know creating a new ID and then clicking use this ID and then switching between them. So it's a it's a much simpler and quicker way to do that. 
And so you can see the possibilities with this. Um, I hope that this video has been really informative. I know I only scratched the surface with the command line and um, everything relating to identity management and permissions management, but hopefully it was good enough to get you a basic head start and get you working with the Composer environment. So I hope you learned a lot and thanks.